We interview everyday people like yourself that uplift and empower, shifting the narrative of news from a traditional negative experience to more impactful. Is on your website, but I wanted to dig just a little bit deeper into it. And so one of the first questions I wanted to ask you is, um, what drew you to the violence specifically? And not only draw, drew you to it, but kept you to where you wanted to continue with it for such a long time? That's a really great question. I wasn't drawn to the violin first. It was actually predetermined in my mother's womb that it would be the instrument that I played. I have a, a family of musicians and there were no string players. So my mom was like, she is going to be our violinist. And I started taking lessons when I was four years old. So it was something that when I was introduced to it, I really enjoyed it. And I must give that credit to my violin teacher. I think that teachers and educators are so powerful in how students can fall in love with sourcing their personal creativity. And I'm so grateful that God allowed my teacher um, to be that first influence on how to learn how to play that instrument because it was it was much bigger than learning how to play the violin. It, it was, you know, getting to do something fun musically. And so that's what got me started. And that attitude of of how fun it was and how it made me feel and how excited I was is ultimately what made me stick with it. And I want to jump over because you have accomplished so much as a musician. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to ask, what does it mean to you to have these accomplishments? And what example do you feel like you're setting for other young musicians, especially um, young women and people of color? That is just a loaded question. Okay, CNN, I love it. Um, you know, I am just so grateful. I think that I never even, well, let me say it like this. I believe in God and I believe in the power of him divinely designing our lives uh, according to his plan, which is, you know, much higher and, and different than what we could ever imagine. I never even could even think to dream about some of the things that uh, God has presented before me. And I'm just so grateful. My hope is that my journey can tell those, you know, of young women, young men, non-binary people, any ethnicity, any color, any dream that they have that is possible. Because I think that uh, so often we judge success on outcomes. And my, my prayer is that we start to really see the success in the journey and all of what we're able to learn and enjoy and how we're able to mature through the different steps of the journey. So I'm just really grateful. And um, yeah, I just, I just pray that people can, can find within themselves that they are successful too in whatever it is the path that they're on and just whatever that path is. Yeah. Okay. And um, so I'm sure you're aware of uh, kind of, I don't know how to phrase it, but like the importance being taken away from the arts in schools mm -hmm. and places like that. Um, so I want to ask you, how do you feel about that? And how do you feel that the arts play a role on not only youth, but just everyone overall? Well, of course, it's a grave loss to me. I just think it is so sad to the cultivation of the full human. You know, all, all of our mental resources deserve to be tapped and deserve to be challenged and stretched. And I truly feel like music and arts education 
not, not only allows you to cultivate creativity, but also it teaches you a discipline that you can't really get from another uh, source. You know, it teaches you a discipline, it teaches you a focus, it gives you an artistic connection that can relate to your history, your ancestral history. It can be very culturally enlightening. It's so much exposure that is dedicated to the arts that really make you be a well-rounded observer, a, a well-rounded listener. And I, I truly feel like that is what is happening to our society today. There's such a breakdown in communication. And part of that communication is because we're not having, there's, there's no space to listen, to embrace what other people have to say without making sure your point is getting across. And part of art is sharing, sharing with community. And uh, I, I, I am saddened to see how that's changing because arts is, is being lost, especially in K through 12 schools. And, and how that affects their higher education. So, of course, it's it's one of my soapboxes, one one of them, um, because I know how how effective it was for for me. You know, I I struggled in some other academic areas, but what I was able to accomplish musically really did help me get on a better path of studying and refocusing for those other areas, studying how to master taking tests. You know, I think it's just a domino effect of affect. And so I truly hope that some of the initiatives that are starting to happen, especially with non-school organizations, outside organizations that are dedicated to the arts, I truly hope that those programs, the El Sistema programs, all, all of those types of outreach programs can start to permeate what's happening back in the public and private school districts. I love that answer because you led me into my next question. So speaking of projects, let's talk a little bit more about your green project. Okay. Um, what is, what would you say is the spark that lit the flame that is the green project? Wow, I'm gonna be really honest with you. I got stood up for a date one night and I was all dressed up. I had just come from a gig. I had my viola with me. I, I had just subbed in the viola section for an orchestra down in DC at the Kennedy Center. I was looking good. I was like, yes, you look good. I showed up at the venue. He was a no show. He never came through, never responded to the text. And here I was sitting there just looking like, well, this, this is not going to pan out. So instead of wallowing in that, I found my way next door to a venue that was hosting an open mic. I had never experienced an open mic before. And I went in, of course, I had my instrument with me because I'd never leave it in the car. And eventually the night led to the DJ saying, hey, you, with the saxophone at the bar, why don't you come and play for us? And I'm looking around like, who who has a saxophone? And the bartender said, that's you, baby girl. I said, but I play the viola. I, I don't, I don't know. So I went up to the uh, DJ booth and I said, hey everybody, my name is Chelsea. I play the saxophone. Some people call it a viola. And I'm gonna play for you today. And he ended up dropping a an instrumental of Kanye West flashing lights. And I sit there and improvised for a good five minutes on my viola. And the owner of the lounge came out of the kitchen, listened, and after I played, asked me to come back that weekend with my band. My band never existed though. That That was something that did not exist before that moment. And I tell you, God works in mysterious ways. Randomly, there was a woman sitting at the table who overheard the conversation between me and the lounge owner. And she just happened to know the entirety of Drew Hill's touring band. Now, Drew, Drew Hill had just gotten off tour 
And she got up and said, oh, she has a band. Yes, she has a band. They'll be here with her on Saturday. And I'm looking at her like, A, I don't know you, and B, I don't know who you're talking about. And so after we talked, I talked to her, and she was like, I know, I know Drew Hill's music director. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to hook you up with them. And sure enough, about an hour and a half later, I got a phone call from their MD asking me what songs I wanted to play. And they would meet me at the venue on Saturday. It was the most whirlwind roller coaster experience. But that Saturday was one of the most, definitely in the top three musical experiences of my life. It was a freedom I had never experienced before. I was playing violin, I was singing, I was playing viola, just having fun with the crowd. And it was literally that night that the Green Project was born. And uh, we've been doing it now for 11 years. So really, really exciting start <laughs> to what's been a mind blowing ride for sure. That was such a left. I was not expecting, I was expecting some very formal story. Like my friends and I were sitting around and we were like, it would be a great idea. That's a really good story. Oh my goodness. Okay. So was there ever like a formal conversation? Like we want to continue to do this. How did it grow from having fun on a Saturday night to what it is now? That's a really good question because things evolve. The industry changes, thing, things evolve. And and honestly, they were going back on tour. So they, they knew that that was just something that was going to be temporary and that they could do while they were back in town. And so as I started recording music for the first time and getting in the studio and writing my own original music for the first time, working with different producers in the area, they really helped educate me on the contemporary execution of music. I had been classically, pretty formally classically trained just all of my life. And this didn't happen until I was studying my master's at Peabody. So that was pretty you know, far into my trajectory. And I was operating from a very classical, orchestra classical mindset. And they were like, that ain't how I work over here. Um, so <laughs> it was a big education for me to shift and learn. And after taking some auditions with some musicians and everything, you know, you start to really form connections and relationships with who you're practicing with and creating with on a regular basis. And so there was a conversation with a group of musicians where we had just auditioned and received a residency. And that residency had a certain amount of committed dates to the performance of it. And so I needed them to be kind of on board for that entire time. And that's really how the train started rolling. Like, you know, let's let's sit and talk about what this is going to look like and how we're going to build these shows over this, you know, six month season. So it happened. And it continues to happen, <laughs> you know, lives, lives change and, and people grow and mature. And so those are ongoing conversations. So based off of what I read about the Green Project, you guys are trying to break stereotypes through music. So what kind of cultural and impact do you think that you're having showing musicians like you don't have to do this in one specific way? There's more than one way to do things. Right. Absolutely. I I hope to do it as many ways as possible. You know, I think part of the Green Project for me is, is just allowing people to enjoy music. And I know that that seems oversimplified, but we are living in such a challenging time where it's almost like there is a thirst for being able to relax, being able to release, and being able to let go of even the personal expectation that we carry. It can be so burdensome. And I think part of what I strive to do with the Green Project, even through our educational programs, because our educational programs span like kindergarten all the way to like retirement homes and corporations. And like we do many things with adults, young children, musicians, non-musicians alike, just to bring back to life what it means to create, what it means to 
to be one with your heart. And, you know, everyone is a musician because our heart has rhythm. What does that even look like? You know, how are we tapping into that every day and how and how are we sourcing that? So part of it is just to show that there's no one way to do anything. You you can do you can put your own spin on it. You can make it to be whatever you want it to be. There's there's no box to to be conformed in. And so that's why I love putting acoustic strings. You know, a lot a lot of people say, Chelsea, why don't you play an electric violin? I said, you know, it's electric enough when I plug it up. But it's something about that acoustic violin with a drum set behind it and a bass next to it. You know, it's just I, I want to start disassociating what it means to have, you know, a violin in an orchestra. Yes, that's beautiful. Also, it's beautiful when you have it with this instrument. And yes, it's beautiful when you have it with concert band. Yes, then it's beautiful when you have it with a, a big band on stage, a jazz combo. So there, I just, there's no one illustration. And I think that's part of the hope that we're all an illustration of beauty of uniqueness in some way. So how do we show that and how do we how do we allow ourselves to be comfortable with that? I want to rewind just a little bit and you started talking about um, your educational programs. Yeah. So um, can you tell me a little bit more about those? Yes, we have a, a series of educational programs that are in schools with organizations. We've worked with a lot of different organizations. We've uh, been privileged to work with some universities and some corporations overseas in the States, in the Caribbean. Um, and we do our best to make music tangible. You know, everyone becomes a musician in our workshops, even if they've never thought about being a musician one day in their life they become an artist. And so our educational programs range from performance style workshops to uh, business workshops, to uh, educational workshops devoted to, you know, different techniques or different harmonic ideas. Um, it, it, it runs the gamut. And so we have about six programs that we've developed at this point. And, um, you know, we're just really happy to touch different communities with these types of educational offerings. And because they're performance based, they really do tap into uh, a different cultural aspect as well. So how does it work? Do you reach out to um, the schools and organizations or do they contact you saying that they want to get involved? How do people find themselves in that? We've done both. We, we've definitely done both. We, we started doing this through that very first residency that we got about 10 years ago. That was a requirement where we did an educational program. We had so much fun developing that one that we ended up doing uh, many different versions of them. And when we received a grant with the State Department as cultural ambassadors to tour overseas, one of the biggest reasons um, that they, well, when we got overseas, I, I would ask the different embassy directors what made them choose us. And one brought to my attention that, you know, she said, you are a black woman playing a violin in a band of all men. And we are in the Middle East. This is something, this is an illustration that, you know, our women and young girls don't get to see a lot and we want to showcase that you know that type of leadership so then we we started doing leadership workshops you know um based on empowerment and what it looks like in that in that sense so there have been both we've, we've reached out to schools so that especially if we're in an area like if we're touring and we're playing a jazz festival in one area we asked i remember when we were playing uh, a jazz festival in birmingham we asked if there was a way we could re work with the high school students in Birmingham. They ended up giving us a workshop with the entire school district. And we did a whole huge concert hall where we had all the high schools come together for one huge workshop. And that was just phenomenal. 
Um, and so, you know, we were able to be very engaging with, with the students in that way. So it works. We, we try to make it work however it can. So kind of backing up a little bit, I know that you have a little bit of a, well, not a little bit, definitely a background of music education. So what caused you or what led you to decide that you wanted to teach others? So it's definitely something that I've seen my whole life model because my father is a music educator and he taught at the performing arts middle school in Houston for over 30 years. So I went to that school, you know, I saw how he did it. And I think for me, I always saw the other side of it though. So it's like you you see what happens at the school and you see how teachers pour into their, their students. And then I always saw the other side of, you know, what he was challenged with um, as being an educator. I think there there's just so much that educators have to deal with that isn't isn't on the fore of what people see and they see the outcomes they see the students going on to be you know whatever they become and what they attain and I think not only did I have a passion for what it meant to cultivate minds but also I have a passion administratively to take care of educators in that space as well because educators are still artists educators are still humans that need mental physical and emotional support and i think um that i just was very drawn to you know having two educators as parents my mother taught uh first grade for over 30 years my dad taught music and so he would teach me things and he would introduce to me different things and concepts. And I think for me, it was more just the whole picture of, of what education meant to me in my life. So when I was presented uh, with the opportunity, it was bigger than me. You know, I don't, I don't feel like uh, it's, it's about me. It's, I feel like it's about the fact that this opportunity has been afforded to me to be a black woman string professor I can count the amount of black string professors in America on both of my hands and, and have fingers left. So I don't take that responsibility lightly, um, you know, and it's something that I know if I were in high school looking at where I wanted to spend my college years and who I wanted to spend though, that, that time with, I could hope I could find someone that represented me. Okay, Dr. Green, you are a musician, you're an educator, groundbreaker, all the things. So what do you do outside of music, if anything, if you have the time? <laughs> that is very kind of you to say and ask. I enjoy reading. I'm in a very active book club and I love, love reading. We do, we, we do a lot of different uh, subject books, but it's something about engaging with a sisterhood and growing mentally and challenging yourself in that way that really keeps me on my toes. And, and I appreciate that. I have a very active prayer group that keeps me in the word and keeps me grounded spiritually, which I'm very grateful for, especially through these pandemic years um, and how that's, how that's changed the world, really. And I just... I escape into lots of housework. <laughs> I, you know, I think, I think that you can always find something to do around the house to keep you busy if there's time to squeeze in those projects. So I definitely stay, I stay moving as much as I can. So how has the pandemic impacted what you're trying to do? If you, you know, there's restrictions on traveling and all this so are you taking more of a virtual approach or have you kind of taken a break it's been to god be the glory there has been a lot of virtual work going on and it's been actually more accessible i think that's one of the um unique blessings in you know in in this in this 
whole thing is that artists have been so gracious and so amenable to coming into my class virtually to just say hello to the students, to pour into my students at Berkeley, or I've I've really been grateful to collaborate with a lot of young um, young artists type of programs. We've produced tracks together. We have talked about music development and songwriting together. I've even done some like harmony and theory workshops with some young artists at different schools around the country. So I have been immensely blessed by the by the type of connection that has been possible virtually. Um, of course, it's nothing like the real thing of being there in person and engaging with people in in real time. I think, though, it's all in how you look at it. It's all in the perspective. And so I'm. it's been a lot online. I had learned about virtual platforms I never knew existed. I learned about apps I didn't know existed. So it's been a huge education for me as well. And this is getting down to the last couple questions here. Um, what is something that you want our readers to take away? Because as you know, we inspire, well, it's all about inspiration. So what do you want readers to take away? Oh my goodness. You're gonna make me start crying. Because I think inspiration is is so real. I have, go I have goosebumps just thinking about it. When I want readers to take at least 10 minutes every morning and physically with a pen and paper write down a dream like every single morning just 10 minutes write down and and meditate on a dream and and i say dream because i don't want to say goal I, I i purposely am not using the word goal because i feel like goals are something that people can turn into something that becomes like a grind to achieve. Whereas a dream is something that you hope to attain. And that's really what I pray stays people's inspiration, that they keep the hope alive, that they stay in a place of faith, um, knowing that there is another side. There is, there is going to be another version of it later. If you will grow from it, it will change. Things will, will be different. And I think that that hope allows us to actually dream. So it is, it is my prayer that um, in staying inspired, everyone can physically just write down their dreams so that they know that they are still attainable. Wow, you gave me goosebumps. I'm feeling emotional. <laughs> um, well, is there anything that you feel that I missed or that I didn't cover or that just that you want people to know about you, your mission, any of that, that you feel like I didn't cover? Well, you covered so many great questions. This has been such an incredible interview. I just want to thank you again for the invitation. I'm so honored to share this time with you and share with your readers. And I would love for your readers to stay connected with me on my website, chelseygreen.com. It's C-H-E-L-S-E-Y, green like the color.com. And on uh, Instagram, at Green Violinist. And on Facebook, we're Chelsea Green and the Green Project. So hopefully, until we can see each other again in person, it would be great to stay connected online. Yes, ma'am, will do. Thank you so much for your time today and for being open and just sharing so much. I feel like I learned a lot that I didn't even know. <laughs> so so I'm very- Thank you for listening. Continue to listen and support our journalism at weinspiremovement.org. Hit us up on all our social media for daily inspiration. Nothing but the good news.